Good afternoon, and welcome to the 2012 Taylor Anderson Japan Foundation Lecture here on the campus of Randolph-Macon College, Taylor Anderson's second home from 2004 until graduation day 2008. After watching that moving video depicting last year's devastating earthquake and tsunami and their horrific after effects, I'm struck again by the magnitude of the tragedy and the thousands of lives it touched, including at least one family who is with us today. At this time, let us pause and together observe a moment of silence for Taylor Anderson and for all the victims of this terrible disaster. Thank you. Let me extend my welcome and respects to Taylor's parents, Andy and Jean Anderson, who join us today to commemorate Taylor's life together with her Randolph-Macon family and our very special Japanese guests. Would the Andersons please stand? What an enormous tribute to Taylor and her legacy that the Japanese ambassador to the United States, Ichiro Fujisaki and Mrs. Fujisaki, have chosen to spend this anniversary day with us as we celebrate Taylor Anderson and remember all those who lost their lives, property, or livelihoods in Japan. We are so honored by your presence. Please stand and let us thank you for being here. We are also pleased to have 28 outstanding graduate and undergraduate students from Japan participating in the U.S.-Japan Council's Knowledge Investment Program, joining us from Washington, D.C. this afternoon. Just before we started, they presented me with this ikebana, the Japanese flower ornament in honor of today's occasion. Would they please stand and allow us to thank them for being here. Representing the Commonwealth of Virginia, we are delighted to welcome two members of Governor McDonald's cabinet, the Honorable Marla Graf Decker, the Commonwealth Secretary of Public Safety, and the Honorable James Chang, Virginia Secretary of Trade and Commerce. There are many organizations working directly to strengthen U.S.-Japan relations through grassroots efforts and youth exchange programs. Please join me in welcoming the president of one of them, the Japan America Society of Washington, D.C., and that is Ambassador John Malott. Finally, I would also like to thank the Japan Foundation Center for Global Partnership for their wonderful and most generous memorial gift to Randolph-Macon College in Taylor Anderson's memory. The Foundation's generosity, in simplest terms, opens up a world of educational opportunities for our students by expanding their global awareness in many ways. 
This year, funds from the Japan Foundation are being used to sponsor today's lecture and to fund summer language instruction in Japan for one of our outstanding students, Amy Donovan, class of 2014. This generous grant will allow us to send Randolph-Macon faculty members to Japan to establish regional resources for our study abroad programs and establish an ongoing Taylor Anderson Japan Foundation Scholars Program that will underwrite student study and travel to Japan, especially during our January term. In addition, this gift has enabled us to create the Taylor Anderson Japan Foundation Japanese Scholar in Residence Program at Randolph-Macon that will greatly enrich the breadth of our Japanese language offerings. With the introduction of our new Asian Studies major, enrollment and interest in all things Japanese have exceeded our greatest expectations and our current resources. And Andy and Jean, I know that Taylor would be proud to have so many students interested in the areas that she was here at Randolph-Macon. So the Taylor Anderson Japan Foundation Japanese Scholar in Residence Program satisfies a very important educational need at RMC. The opportunity to partner with the Japan Foundation is strengthening Japanese studies at Randolph-Macon College while honoring the life, work, and generous spirit of Taylor Anderson. The Foundation's outstanding director and former Council General of Japan in Denver, Colorado, Kazuaki Kubao and his wife have traveled from New York City to join us this afternoon. Please stand so that we might recognize and thank you. Today's lecture brings to Randolph-Macon both Ambassador and Mrs. Fujisaki and noted, noted journalist Yuki Naguchi of National Public Radio who reported from Japan on last year's tragic events. And as I mentioned earlier, we are also very honored to have the Anderson family with us. Their profound dignity in dealing with the loss of their daughter was such an example for us all. And I would now like to call on Mr. Andy Anderson, Taylor's father, to share his thoughts with us. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, Jean, Jules, Jeff, and I would like to thank Ambassador and Mrs. Fujisaki for always including our family and events related to the Great Eastern Japan earthquake. We would also like to thank them for their care, compassion, and concern for us. For that, we cannot say arigato enough, and we'll be forever grateful to our friends, the Fujisakis. We thank the Japan Foundation and Randolph-Macon for producing this event in Taylor's honor as part of the Japan, Japan Foundation grant named Honoring the Life, Work, and Good Spirit of Taylor Anderson, Enhancing Japanese Studies at Randolph-Macon College. Monty Dixon was the other JET teacher who lost his life in the tsunami. The Japan Foundation has sponsored a similar program at Monty Dixon's College in Alaska and also a program in Taylor and Monty's honor which sends 32 high school students to Japan for 15 days each summer for five years, with last year being the first year. These are wonderful tributes that I'm sure Taylor and Monty appreciate. We'd also like to thank Taylor Jet and Jet alumni for their support over the past year. There's a bond there that is very strong. Taylor learned a lot and enjoyed her time at Randolph-Macon, especially with her Alpha, Gamma, Delta sisters. We thank them for their support as well. Taylor was awarded a summer undergraduate research fellowship between her sophomore and junior years at Randolph-Macon. 
She read many of the works of the Japanese author Haruki Murakami, wrote a report and gave a presentation with the other surf participants. One of the points she concluded the author made was there is a need for connections among people for problems to be solved. What I'd like to talk to you about today is connections. Taylor's Fund is all about making the connections and forming the relationships to help with recovery. We always felt when Taylor first went missing after the earthquake and tsunami that she's probably in a shelter or a school helping with or being helped by others. When it turned out that she was one of the thousands in that area in Ashinamaki that could not escape the tsunami, we instantly thought she would want us to help as she would have done. Ambassador and Mrs. Fujisaki were instrumental in connecting us to the people in Japan who could keep Taylor's dream alive for her students, families, and schools. What we are doing now and hope to do for years to come is to build on Taylor's dream to be a bridge between our two countries. One level of connection that will take many years to solve is how displaced families go forward. They are perhaps in a shelter now and there are so many decisions to be made that will affect whether they start over somewhere else or return to their family home. While those decisions are being made, we think Taylor's focus would be on her students. They need the opportunity to continue to grow and learn while the long process of reconstruction continues. That is the connection we are working on, working on making with Taylor's Fund. Those children will continue to be nurtured by their parents and teachers. Taylor's Fund support that effort. One example is the Taylor Anderson Reading Corners, or Bunkos, that will be at each of the seven schools in which Taylor taught. The Taylor Bunkos are about trying to help students learn what their dreams are and inspire them to live them. We traveled to Ashinamaki this past September to help dedicate the first Taylor Bunko at Mungakura Elementary School. That's, that's the school that was in the Japanese Chamber Commerce of Video you saw earlier. And those were some of her students talking. Part of what we told Taylor's sixth grade students at the September 6th Taylor Bunko dedication was, and I quote, the dedication on the bookshelf and the book labels read, in memory of Taylor Anderson and all loved ones lost on March 11, 2011. We will never be at peace with losing Taylor, and we share that feeling with the many others who lost loved ones on March 11th. What we can be at peace with is how well we honor and remember them. And most of all, how well we are inspired and follow their good examples. Reading inspired Taylor to live her dreams, and we hope the books and computer software will help inspire you to find and live yours. We hope when you think of the Taylor Bunko, you think of finding your dreams and having the courage and energy to live them. That would make Taylor happy. But we hope most of all that you remember this gift is from the love that Taylor had for you, her students." End quote. Her fund is also helping support children's homes through Small Kids Japan, including helping a high school senior go to college. Funds have been donated to help the more than 200 orphans from the Tohoku disaster stay in the homes of a relative rather than go to a children's home. Average school costs are approximately $260 a month, which is the major expense that the Fund for the Future of Children affected by the Great East Japan Earthquake pays. Also, many universities have provided scholarships for Tohoku students affected by the disaster, but the students' families must pay interest exam fees approaching $3,000 to be able to take advantage of the scholarships. Taylor's Fund has and will help with these fees through a nonprofit called Hope for Tomorrow. There are 120 jets in Miyagi. That's the prefecture where Mishinomaki is located. Taylor's Fund is providing microgrants to empower Miyagi Jets to go beyond the classroom to be active participants and leaders in their schools and communities. So it could be that they'll start a chess club and buy chess boards, or it could be that they'll have a, um, a concert on a Saturday. But it lets the Jets figure out how they can best help um, their students in their area. Long term, Taylor's Fund will support exchange and scholarship programs for years to come all with the idea of helping students live their dreams as Taylor did. We are working with the YMCA on these programs. We couldn't do this without the help of St. Catharines who donates their time and expertise so that 100% of the money donated goes to these efforts in Japan. So those are some of the connections we are making to help with the recovery. 
Another part of recovery is healing from loss. Endo San is the bookshelf maker for the Taylor Bunkos, and he and his wife lost all three of their children. Endo San knew of Taylor from two of his children who were Taylor students. We met him last September at the Taylor Bunko dedication. We learned how he made the bookshelves and, sh and shared our condolences. Endo San recently installed the second Taylor Bunko at Watanoa Elementary School. This is the school where Endo San's children were students. We were happy to hear last week that Endo San and his wife are reading to the students there. That warmed our hearts. Our connection through Taylor is helping both of our families heal and go forward to live our dreams as we know Taylor would want us to do. Arigato. Thank you, Andy, for those thoughtful and heartfelt remarks. You have our commitment that we will do all that we can to increase those connections that Taylor would have desired. Today we are so truly honored to have the Japanese ambassador to the United States join us on this very important anniversary as we pay tribute to the courageous people of Japan. During his career, Ambassador Fujisaki has had a long and illustrious record of service to both the United States and Japan, and has held many significant positions, including that of teacher and lecturer to colleges and universities in both countries. His connection with the United States is longstanding. He's been called a Seattle boy, owing to his own time spent in the Emerald City while in junior high school as an exchange student. Ambassador Fujisaki was an important symbol of the remarkable spirit and perseverance of the Japanese people during last year's horrific tragedy and its aftermath. Indeed, he is respected and well recognized throughout the world for his important contributions to humanity and peace. It is now my great honor to welcome to Randolph-Macon College, the Japan's ambassador to the United States of America, His Excellency Ichiro Fujisaki. Thank you very much, uh, President Langren. Andy and Jean, Secretary Becker, Secretary Chen, all the board members, and ladies and gentlemen. This is one year from th this tragic, tragic event. Incident happened a year ago. Today, one newspaper wrote, one year later, nothing is resolved. I do not share that view. I do not also say that we have recovered too. This was much too big a disaster to say that because it was 9.0 magnitude earthquake, Japan has not experienced in 1,000 years. Tsunami went up to 133 feet, feet and nuclear accident. Humankind, mankind has never experienced such a combination of disaster. We are still struggling. 
but one thing I can report to you is we are on the recovery road. Nearly 19,000 people are still either lost or missing. And the most important thing is to take care of their family, those take care of the housing of those people who has lost their houses, and we are now, and people who have lost their jobs as well. So this is the main priority we are now trying to cope with. Second is infrastructure. This was really badly damaged. The damage to infrastructure was about 10 times larger than that happened to Katrina. So government is putting in nearly 30% of its annual budget into restoration, which is outside of the debt repayment. But what we are aiming is not just to restore, it is to reconstruct Japan in a way that will be more resilient to such disasters. So it is may, maybe we can call it a renaissance of Japan. Third is nuclear accident. This was beyond the expectation of scientists and engineers. Last December, we were able to come to a stage equivalent to cold shutdown, but for decommissioning of reactors, it will take decades. So we'll continue to struggle. But we are, in general, optimistic because of three reasons. One, we have a past history of recovering from disasters. 150 years ago, Japan opened up for the first time the country in 200 years. And in about 34 years, we were able to catch up. 60 years ago, we were devastated after World War II. In about 20 years, we were in a situation where we can have Olympic Games in Tokyo. In 1970s, we had been struck by two oil shocks, but we were able to recover and make an energy efficient economy. The world's one of the most energy efficient economy. Second reason we are hopeful is we are united and we are resolved in recovering all the Japanese. Many youngsters who were thought to be very inward looking went out to volunteer to help this is a scene that no one has expected before. Third reason we are optimistic is that we are not alone. We are helped by people around the world, but top of the list is, as you have just seen, Americans, you Americans. You have helped us coming back to this stage and without your help, this was not possible. So representing all Japanese, I will say from bottom of our heart, thank you very much. Arigato. I have not met Taylor Anderson. But in the past one year, I have heard so much about her so that I now feel like I know her. I know that she's a loved member of the family. She was loved by her colleagues, friends, and she was an excellent teacher and a diplomat as well. As you all know, she was intrigued to Japan when she was in childhood. And she wanted to live there 
and she wanted to be a bridge between the two peoples. And that is exactly what she did. Her life was much too short. But she accomplished her will. She accomplished her mission. I think the parents, your friends, can be really proud of her. Talking about the parents, Andy and Jean, in this one year, we had many occasions to meet them, and we were very much impressed, and we became friends. What they told us is that knowing Taylor, she would not want to see the parents thinking that March 10, 2011 was the last happy day in their life. So they decided to become positive and solicited funding from college friends and created this memorial fund foundation. Japan Foundation contributed to this and one of that is this reading corner just Andy has told you. This is the bookshelves with books that she loved. Last September, uh, last July, my wife Yuriko and I was back in Japan and we had vis visited the area, Ishinomaki, Mangokura, in a car driven by our daughter who had lived there before and knew the uh, streets. We met this Mr. Endo, Shinichi Endo, a woodcarver that Andy just stopped, who has lost all three children, two of them Taylor's students, and he learned about this and he wanted to involve in this project of Reading Corner, Taylor Anderson, Reading Corner. So this project is the collaboration of parents who lost their children, parents who wanted to turn this tragedy into more forward-looking. So last September 6, all the family members visited Ishinomaki to present this book corner, reading corner. Eureka and I were not able to be there. Our daughter represented us in that ceremony and reported to us how moving it was. Now, I think how would now Taylor be thinking if she were here and if I think she's here? She'll, I think she'll be very happy that her parents, her friends, all those who loved her is involved in such and forward-looking project and try to be, fortify the bridge between the two peoples. I think all of us will promise her to engage in even more in enhancing these projects and we will go on. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon. It is my honor on behalf of the Randolph-Macon community to introduce the keynote speaker of the Taylor Anderson Japan Foundation Lecture. Yuki Noguchi is a general assignment reporter covering business for NPR's National Desk, and her pieces can be heard on Morning Edition, All Things Considered, and Weekend Edition. Just in this past week, you might have heard her reports on the U.S. jobless rate, the continuing mortgage crisis, and the small business identity theft. Yuki's parents left Japan to study in the United States in the early 1970s. She grew up in St. Louis and continues to root for her beloved Cardinals baseball team, the reigning World Series champions, by the way. She received her bachelor's degree in history from Yale University. During her student days, she also studied for a year in Yokohama, Japan, and worked for the Kyodo News Service in Tokyo. Entering the world of journalism, she reported on business and politics for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle, and the Orlando Sentinel. From 2000 to 2008, Yuki worked at the Washington Post, first as a reporter and later as an editor, covering business and the telecommunications industry. In 2008, she joined National Public Radio as a correspondent, and it was in that role she was offered an assignment to report from Japan just a few weeks after the earthquake and tsunami in April 2011. In an interview a few days ago for our local NPR affiliate in Richmond, Yuki described this chance to report from the disaster area as a special opportunity and a gift. In disaster-stricken areas such as Rikuzen Takata and Kesen Numa, Yuki saw things she described as unlike anything you could possibly imagine. However, despite the destruction and despite the tragedy that continued to unfold before her eyes last April, Yuki says that her lasting impression of this trip to Japan was a sense of surprise at how resilient human nature could be. Her talk today is entitled Postscripts from Japan, Stories that Endure After the Earthquake and Tsunami. Please join me in welcoming Yuki Noguchi. Good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you to Rand Randolph Macon College and the Japan Foundation, to the ambassador for his presence here and everyone else. Thank you to Taylor Anderson's family and friends for the invitation. It's an honor to tr represent the spirit of this event and the spirit of the woman for whom it's named. I'm so pleased about speaking here today because this is a story that's very close to my heart. My name is Yuki Naguchi. My parents moved here from the US, uh, from Japan, before I was born. They intended to go back, but never did. So I grew up in the United States as an American. I'm now a correspondent for National Public Radio. And if you're an NPR listener, which I sincerely hope you all are, you probably think of me as the bearer of bad news because I'm often reporting on jobless problems and mortgage crises and things like this. But on this day last year, I wasn't at work. I was on maternity leave, recovering from the birth of my second son. His birth had gone relatively smoothly, but at some point, I began bleeding internally. The problem went undetected for seven hours. I lost nearly my entire blood supply during that time. My heart was only beating three times a minute when a nurse diagnosed what the doctors had overlooked. And what I felt in those next few minutes haunt my every moment since. I knew where I was. I was right at the cusp of where life meets death. Nurses wheeled me into the emergency room. And in that instant, I had to confront the possibility of a future not shared with my sons. I choked with anguish and tried to formulate dying wishes to a husband in disbelief. And as the doctor put the mask over my face and instructed me to breathe deeply, I felt myself resist wanting to prolong what might be my last conscious moment. It's terrifying how grave circumstances can creep up on you like that. I was there and nearly wasn't. A single more moment severs you from the life you thought was normal and leaves you altered. 
That experience left me yearning to do something worthy before the next moment like that came upon me and maybe went the other way. I'm no hero. There's little or nothing noble about the life that I lead. But looking back, I was probably seeking a way to transcend my normal life, to justify the fact of my continued existence. The earthquake struck, and it felt as if there was just no option but to go to Japan. I won't say leaving was simple. I had a nursing newborn and a toddler, and I was torn about leaving them behind. There was also the issue of aftershocks and nuclear power plants in the process of melting down. But I'm the only reporter who spoke Japanese, and besides, it was a story I knew I very much wanted to tell. And what I want to tell you about today are parts of the story that never aired on the radio. I want to tell you about how incredibly, under the worst of circumstances, I witnessed some of the best of humanity. Today I want to tell you three stories, vignettes I collected but never reported or only partially told. To me, they endure because they are about resilience and grace, and even humor. But first, I'll tell you what it's like to cover a disaster. I arrived in Japan exactly a month after the earthquake and tsunami. The first thing you encounter is logistics. It's the nuts and bolts stuff. Affected areas didn't have cell phone or internet service, so it's wise to carry a satellite phone. Many local taxi drivers can't get you anywhere because the landscape has changed so much. Roads and bridges are often blocked. And it goes without saying that you can't impose on a disaster zone. The disaster zone is not there to host you. You must act as your own pack mule. You tote batteries, food and water, a camera, extra sets of microphones and recorders in case one fails you. And when you leave, you haul all your garbage with you. Reporters come carrying thousands of dollars in cash. Why? Because, of course, ATMs and credit cards don't work in a disaster zone. Gasoline, if you can find it, is expensive. And even in the most desperate of times, money talks. If you're lucky and find a savvy driver willing to take you, it costs several hundred dollars a day. I stayed in towns inland where I could restock on supplies. I commuted to the coastline three or four hours round trip. When a disaster is fresh, a reporter's job is pretty straightforward. You, doc you document what's happening right in front of you. It's incredibly raw. You encounter grief unprocessed. Even just a month later, things are very different. The sense of panic has left, giving way to a weary kind of reality. Most TV cameras are gone. Most of the international reporters have packed up and left. Devastation and destruction become old news, even to the people who live there. And the reporter who arrives at that point is tasked with looking for stories that go beyond the immediacy of shock. The challenge is answering more elusive questions, like what now, what next? As most of you know, it was the northeastern part of Japan that saw the most devastation. The land there runs north-south in a relatively narrow strip. There are mountains that run up the middle of the land like a backbone. From inland, you drive through mountain passages to get to the coastline. These coastal towns are relatively isolated and blessed with natural beauty. When I arrived, it was April and cherry blossom season, which is an exquisite time of year. Driving in, you see lush greens and black rock, which are a backdrop for these fresh pink blossoms. But that beauty makes for an even starker contrast when you get to the wreckage. As you get closer to the ocean, twisted remains of trucks, clothes, concrete block dot the landscape. Three and a half miles, that's how far the tsunami pushed these things in from the coast. As you get closer, the entire landscape looks leveled. And by leveled, I mean pulverized. Nothing but debris 20 feet or more deep, as far as you can, as you can see. The town is there, and then it isn't. When I arrive, Japanese troops had cleared enough roadway to allow traffic to flow. 
people who'd been there since the beginning remarked how clean it looked. In fact, it looked like a catastrophe by any other measure. You'd see sides of buildings stacked on boats sitting on top of crushed cars. Basically, it's not a place you'd expect life to go on at all. And yet it did. You'd think a person's sense of humor would die on the spot, but it doesn't. All three of the stories I want to tell you about today happened in the city of Rikuzen Takata. The architecture there had been beautiful and rustic. All the local homes and businesses had these uh, lacquered shingles that looked like pottery. My first story is about the owner of a soy sauce company there, which had been in the family for nine generations. Michihiro Kono is, was a great ambassador and guide to the city. He's a natural leader. The night of the earthquake, he warmed himself by a campfire and started designing an action plan to get the city and its people back on its feet. The next day, he began tracking his employees down at shelters and told them to report to work. He set up a makeshift office and a shed, and in the weeks that followed, he began preaching the mantra of rebuild and renew to other business owners. Without work, he argued, there will be no residence, and without any residence, the city will never come back to life. But Kono isn't an earnest type. He's not a stern type. He's easygoing and hadn't outgrown his teenage impishness. He has a comics gift for timing and mimicry. He attracts people because his running commentary on life hits just the right pitch. One afternoon, he drove me to his old neighborhood. We went to where his soy sauce factory once stood. He could identify it by the groove on the ground where a sliding door once was. I wanted to know what his soy sauce smelled like, so we drove to one of this, these giant wooden barrels where he used to ferment the soy sauce. It was empty, but it still smelled savory and rich. It's very hard to get a sense for a place that has no shape. The landscape gave no hint of the life that was led before. Often you'd come upon a, a washed up photo or even entire albums. It felt so personal, yet they belonged to anyone or no one. So it became customary to take private documents like these and put a stone on top on the side of the road in case the owner came looking for it. These little lost and founds looked a little bit like memorials. But nothing salvaged was ever larger than a shoebox, which is why Kono knew I'd catch my breath when he said, we recently found our house and it's perfectly intact. It sat half submerged in the ocean six miles away. <laughs> it turns out Kono and his wife spotted the rooftop of their house off the coast of another town. It was unmistakably theirs. It had apparently lifted off its foundation and bobbed through the water for six miles and settled in one piece. The satellite dish perched on the roof, perfectly intact. What he described as his house's joyride, of course, left him homeless. He also lost his 200-year-old business and two of his employees, as well as dozens of friends. Almost nothing he owned was insured. He was stripped bare of everything that doesn't matter, plus many things that do. But by God, he still had that satellite dish. <laughs> Until then, it never occurred to me that laughing was possible under these circumstances. But to not laugh is to surrender to a sense of total and complete loss. And if there was one common trait among those I met and interviewed, it was that no one considered themselves a victim. Some, like Kono, laughed, but not a single one spoke a word of self-pity. My second story concerns some people I never met, it has to do with a school in, in Rikusen Takata. I saw this school from a distance. The concrete structure was ravaged, but it was still one of the only buildings still left partially standing. Behind the school, maybe 100 meters away, there was a steep hill. Rikusen Takata is a little bit, you can picture it kind of like a basin. It's surrounded by these high hills. And those who sur survived the tsunami did so because they clambered up those hills. You can actually see the demarcation line that separated life from death 
on the land itself. Above a certain elevation, there were trees and green grass. Below it, sludge and debris. Every scar in this scene is an invitation to imagine the early afternoon of March 11th. So when you're told that this building in the distance is what remains of an elementary school, your mind does the desperate calculations. The number of children, the distance to that hill, the speed with which they had to move. Standing there, I felt myself going half mad with another mother's panic. I recast myself as the parent who couldn't outrun the wave to get to her children. That blind terror is preserved in me like a fly in amber. But, as it turns out, 100% of the children in that school survived. They all survived because grandmothers, grandfathers, and parents flocked to the school and started throwing them up the hill to safety. In the process, many of the grandparents and parents perished. Though I never met or interviewed the parents or their children, the story is the most vivid to me. It's horrifying and captivating and inspiring. It strikes the same chord in me that was struck when I was lying on the gurney, gasping, grasping for a chance to have a future with my children. You're there, then you might not be. The moment comes upon you suddenly. There's no time for anguish or disbelief. What do you do? What did these people do? They put their children ahead of them, literally by hurling them. These people were in the act of doing something heroic, even as their moment crept up on them. Finally, I want to tell you about Masako Ito. Ito is about the last person to call attention to herself, which is why I narrowly missed meeting her in the first place. She'd lost her daycare business. Her staff was scattered, still searching for lost family members. Parents told her that their kids were crying at night and wet their beds. Kids played games they called earthquake and asked for their lost toys. And she turned her questions on me, putting some ill-advised faith in my expertise on the matter. How should she counsel these parents? What had I found out? Ito searched me the way parents searched her. But the question of how to heal psychologically on this scale was not one for which there are ready answers. Everyone knows, but no one wants to say, that it will take years, if ever, to heal. In the meantime, there is Masako Ito absorbing their stories. She embraces the parents and their children. Because there's nowhere else for them to put the pain, she quietly takes it on for herself. She didn't say that, of course. I could just see she was channeling the anguish of others as if it were her own. And in fact, she had plenty of her own. Well into the interview, as I thought about leaving, Ito very reluctantly told me her story. Her husband was washed away, washed away in the tsunami. They found his body. She and her in-laws debated whether to take her three children to see him. She did, because she, was, she felt it was necessary to say goodbye. Yet they all avoided talking about death, except that her middle daughter had recurring nightmares about also losing her mother in a tsunami. Ito talked about the stark loneliness of lying awake with no one to talk to at 3 a.m. Reporting can be a wonderful vocation. You set out to f hoping to capture an honest story, but once in a while you find a Masako Ito who tells you something with such candor that it feels like pain is your only reward. And when it happens, it feels like a betrayal of your sense of humanity to just play the role of observer. In the weeks after, I found myself harboring what I'll call rescue fantasies. I thought about meeting Ito and her children again one day. Perhaps I'd fly them to the US and treat them to a trip of their lifetime. Twice I tried to call Ito without a specific address or a phone number. I left unreturned messages on a government office answering machine. 
I told myself I'd do my part to heal their hearts. But the truth is that fantasy served only one person, and that was me. Anyway, Ito herself wasn't seeking rescue. In fact, she told me she felt very lucky and incredibly grateful. Lucky because tragedy has a way of spotlighting how much you still have that you still value. She was grateful because the outpouring of aid and attention made those initial weeks so much more bearable. Ito wore donated clothes and used donated toys in her temporary day daycare. She felt her community embraced by the love of people from afar. At the end of the interview, Ito picked up a Hello Kitty doll. She insisted I take it home to my kids. Of course, I refused. And so we began this absurd standoff where she was chasing me around the library <laughs> and I ran away from Hello Kitty. It's a token of my appreciation, she'd say, as I try to point out the obvious, which is that I'm not the one living in a disaster zone. What can I say? Soft-spoken Ito turns out to have a will of steel. <laughs> she cornered me with that kitty until I agreed to take it with me. It seems like a meta metaphor for my entire reporting mission. I went in hoping to give, and I came back embarrassed by all that I got. What I got is an opportunity to bear witness to people who face life and death's most terrifying realities with grace, humor, and compassion. I want to thank you all for being here today. Remembrance is not an easy task. To remember is to let yourself be occupied by a memory and to feel changed by it. And if the act of doing this inspires you to write checks for humanitarian aid, then by all means, please do so. But that is not an end point. When I asked Masako Ito what she most wanted, she said it was for us not to forget. So here I am asking you to remember. Thank you very much for the privilege. And I'd love to take your questions. <laughs>